Okay, welcome and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Béla Soltes, Assistant Professor at ELTE, and I'm glad to welcome uh, the audience and also our speaker at the event titled The Latin American Pink Tide in Historical Perspective. Um, this is one of uh, one in the series of, of uh, uh, the lecture series that we are doing online. Um, these, uh, uh, this is actually the fourth one that that uh, that we organize in an online format. But this time, the speaker is joining us from Brazil. Uh, it's half past twelve in São Paulo. Um, Fabio Luiz Barbosa dos Santos is professor of Latin American Studies at the Federal University of São Paulo, Brazil and research associate at the University of Witwatersrand. He's the author of several books in political science dealing with the topic of Latin American uh, society and politics, such as The Origins of Radical Thought and Politics in Latin America, or Beyond PT, The Crisis of Brazilian Left in Latin American Perspective, and his most recent book, of which we will speak quite a lot uh, today, um, is titled Power and Impotence, A History of South America Under Progressivism, which was published this year at uh, Haymarket Editions. And this particular book uh, is providing a very detailed overview of the rise and the fall of the so-called pink tide of progressive governments uh, in Latin American countries. These governments were growing out uh, from the mobilizations against neoliberalism in the 90s, and many South American uh, countries uh, opted for uh, leftist governments, which were identified with political change. But as opposed to these old school leftist governments and, and presidents such as Fidel Castro in Cuba, uh, many of these leaders were moderate and hence uh, the allusion to a pink tide instead of a red tide. So uh, this is the origin of, of, uh, of the term. But two decades after uh, Hugo Chavez's electoral victory, this trend seemed to be reversed. So Jill Rousseff was out, Cristina Kirchner was out, Rafael Correa was out, uh, Evo Morales uh, was also out, and figures like Jair Bolsonaro and Mauricio Macri uh, appeared uh, on the stage, and Venezuela descended to an unprecedented crisis. But as we see these days, actually, the mass is back to power in Bolivia, the Kirchnerismo is back to power in Argentina. Um, Mexico finally elected a leftist president after voting to the right during this whole historical period uh, of the pink tide. On the other hand, we just witnessed that Ecuador was voting for neoliberalism uh, a couple of days ago. So while we cannot say that the pink tide is, is gone and this is history. We can't uh, say that the subsequent blue tide or, or right-wing politics tide uh, has disappeared um, with time. So see, we see different progress uh, pr uh, processes or progresses these days. So this is why it's important to evaluate uh, the historical role of, of, of Latin American progressivism from a historical uh, perspective and we are lucky to have uh, Fabio here because he, based on hundreds of interviews, uh, addressed the trajectory of different Latin American countries um, in, in the past uh, 20 years. And there is a, an analysis of uh, most of these countries in his book and also an analysis of the integration of, uh, of, of Latin America, the integration uh, organizations. So focusing on key issues in, in, in given countries, for example, the ecology versus capitalism in the case of Ecuador, uh, or the political economy of neoliberalism in the case of Chile, uh, Fabio went on analyzing key aspects of the processes um, of countries with the progressive government uh, in the past uh, 20 years. So we will hear a brief overview of certain topics uh, raised uh, by Fabio in approximately 50 minutes, and then we will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, from, uh, from Fabio. And the event will be recorded and shared on the YouTube channel of at the Latin America Research Center. So those who could not be present uh, right, uh, right now will be able to watch uh, the presentation afterwards. So once again, thank you so much for the audience for coming and thank you so much, Fabio, for accepting our invitation and uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Bella. Good afternoon, everybody. It is a big pleasure to be here with you in this afternoon. I am among those that um, think that the 
closer academic and political bonds between Latin America in general and Eastern Europe in general, or between Brazil in particular and Hungary are very promising. And it's something that I personally am willing to, uh, to invest energy on it. So I hope this, uh, this talk and this interaction that we are about to have uh, can be um, no more than just a, a first step on, on what could be uh, further collaborations and, uh, and interactions. Um, so I will share a, 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 a power, uh, PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, just let me know, is it okay, Bella, can you see it? Yeah, I see it, it's fine. Okay, okay. So, so my talk will unfold in two moments, so to speak. Uh, in the first half, I intend to do a context setting work in order to place this uh, so-called South American pink tide in a broader historical context. And when I talk about a broader historical context, I mean it in two senses. In the first place, in the sense that I would place it in, 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 in a larger time frame within Latin American history, but also in the sense that this approach should make it easier to compare Latin America historical evolution with other regions such as Eastern European, for example. In the second moment of my talk, I will approach the pink tide itself and I intend to outline an interpretation of its rise and demise. So my focus will be to provide a, a general framework of this uh, historical trend, but I will also be happy to detail and discuss any national context that you, uh, that you wish in the, in the Q&A section that should follow. So I will start setting up the context. And in order to do that, I will go back in time just to make sure that um, everybody's in the same page. I'm not very, I'm, I'm, I don't know how much familiar you are with, with a history of Latin America. So, uh, but, but, but I, I, I hope this makes sense once we get to the tide itself. So the colonization of the Americas can be seen was an offshoot of, of the maritime expansion of European countries in the 15th and 16th centuries. So it was within this broader framework that Christopher Columbus arrived in the Caribbean in 1492 and Pedro Álvarez Cabral in the Brazilian coast in 1500, triggering the conquest of what was then called as the New World. So um, in every case, the colonization of the Americas combined settlement and exploitation. But in reality, the former only took off as a necessary condition of the later, that is to say, settlement only took place to the extent that it was necessary to populate this territory in order to make it profitable. This was the drive between uh, the traffic of enslaved Africans, which marked Brazilian colonial past and also the Caribbean. The only case where the key drive of the colonial process was settlement and not exploitation was the 13 colonies that originated the United States of America. So that if anyone wants to understand why Latin American history has evolved differently from the United States, one has to go back to its colonial roots, to its colonial times. So the colonization of the New World can also be seen as, as a cog in a process of, of primitive accumulation of capital that underpins the transition from feudalism to, to, to capitalism. From this perspective, there are structural connections between the Industrial Revolution the crisis of the old regime in Europe and the process of independence in the Americas. So that between the Haitian revolution in 1804 and the battle of Ayacucho that was fought in the Peruvian Altiplanos 20 years later, all of colonial Latin America was emancipated, all except for some islands such as uh, notably Cuba and Puerto Rico, which is interesting because they now they, today they make the extremes in Latin America as uh, so uh, if we consider you know the sovereignty of, of, of countries. However, with the exception of Haiti, of the Haitian revolution, independence preserved the structures of class domination inherited from colonial times. So against this background, the uniqueness of the Brazilian case was its conservative character. Not even a war was fought in Brazil and independence took place as a negotiation giving birth in 1822 to a slave empire in South America, which was, by the way, ruled by a Portuguese prince. In fact, 
as the only monarchy in the Americas and the last country to abolish slavery on the continent, Brazil was a conservative reference to the region throughout the 19th century, a little bit like uh, Russia was in Europe throughout the 19th century. So it is important to have this broad framework in mind to assess the specificity of the colonial experience in Latin America when compared, for example, with Africa or Asia. So I will, I will, I will highlight three, three important differences. First, its duration, as it lasted over three centuries. Second, because it took place against the background of the transition from, from feudalism to capitalism, as opposed to what Eric Hobsbawm uh, called as the age of empire, when European imperialism uh, towards Asia and Africa was driven by the expansion of capitalist, of monopolist capital in the, in the later half of the 19th century. Lastly, this framework also has political implications as political independence in the Americas was achieved long before the colonization of Africa and Asia intensified precisely under the age of empire. So the paradox here is that as Latin American societies were forged by colonization, and since colonization was underscored by a mercantile drive, capitalist relations took roots in, 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 in a comparatively smoother fashion in Latin American societies in this time in the age of empires. When smoother, I mean when compared to other societies. So there was no, no great mutiny such as in India, no um, boxer uh, rebellion such as in China or Zulu rebellion and like in South Africa or the Bird War. So it's, it's, it's a different dynamics, the one that brings, you know, um, Latin America within the, um, um, the, the framework of, of the expansion of capitalist uh, relations. Of course, this was an uneven process in all of Latin America, so that in some countries at the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century, there was an important economic boom driven by the exportation of commodities, such as wheat and meat in Argentina or Uruguay, or copper in Chile, or coffee in the case of, of Brazil or, or Colombia. In these cases, the surplus from, from the export sector stimulated economic diversification and also the onset of industrialization process. In other cases, such as in Central American countries, foreign capital dominance, and that means um, specifically US capital dominance, was direct and constituted what dependence theory later named as enclave economies. The Banana Republic was the iconic image of this situation. So between industrialization in Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and other countries, and the Banana Republic situation, such as in Central America republics and the Caribbean, <laughs> Latin America contemporary history is marked by the articulation of economic dependence and social inequality, which of course typifies underdevelopment as a whole. So the contrast of different Latin American countries reveals similarities and differences, as, as is the case with any historical comparison. However, there is a perceivable similarity in the general sense of the historical movement. So we could say that in the, in the, in the historical sphere, it is possible to synthesize this, this, this general sense in the sequence of import substitution industrialization, which took place from the uh, specifically from the interwar period on, uh, then the internationalization of domestic markets, which took place under the Cold War, debt crisis and inflation in the 80s, uh, neoliberalism in the 90s, then um, the commodities super cycle world in the 21st century, and recession. And if we, if we look this from, from a rather political standpoint, we could speak of a national developmentalist landscape, then a dynamics of revolution and counter-revolution that typified the, the, the subcontinent under the Cold War, a democratic opening in the, 80s, in, in the 80s, the weakening of traditional ordinary political parties, as we'll speak about that later, then the pink tide and its demise. Some some aspects of this pattern are not so different from other parts of the third war, of the, of, of the former third war. But perhaps uh, the specificity of Latin American underdevelopment has to do with the peculiarities of its colonial experience, which is um, 
which underpins, for example, racism against blacks in Brazil, or the discrimination of indigenous majority in countries such as Bolivia or Peru. So in, in Latin America in general, discrimination against migrants, for example, is not a key issue, considering that we are mostly, we are immigrants ourselves elsewhere. But it also has to do with the global role of the United States and how it has shaped its approach to the region since the 19th century. I won't go into details in that, but it suffice to say that the US cultural, political and economic dominance in Latin America has no parallel in, all, in other regions. US might, US power is lived differently, let's say in Brazil and in India, for example. Just to give you an example, um, I, 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 had, I had a chance of, of, of being in India as a visiting uh, professor in, in, in recent years. And last time that I've been there, as soon as I, when I arrived in Sao Paulo, in the way from, from the airport to, to the town itself, I saw this, um, there was this, this billboards. They were saying, most of them was just saying, welcome, Paul. And, I, and, and, and it took me a while to realize what did they mean when they say welcome, Paul. Then I realized it was because Paul McCartney was about to, you know, to hold two concerts in town. And the first thing that came to my mind was that such, such billboards would be impossible in India. Like, we know that the Beatles and Paul McCartney they did go to India in the 60s and the 70s, but they went there, you know, to spend time in ashrams to learn this, to, how to play the sitar and so forth. So obviously I know that the Beatles are British, that they're not American, but the point that I want to make is like, is like the, 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 the weight of this, uh, let's say mainstream Western culture in a country like Brazil or in Latin America in general is unparalleled in, in, the, in the third world, I would say. So, so in short, I would say that there is a, um, a common historical background between all Latin American countries that goes back to colonial times, which makes itself present in the articulation between dependence and inequality. And these common denominators imply a relative simultaneity between different national processes. Or we can also see, or we can also attest that um, when we look at Cuba, for example, as a counterproof, when we look at the history of Cuba, since the, the, uh, the Cuban revolution in 1959, and when we see that Cuba has a, a very different um, pattern of evolution, this um, shows um, what is uh, the implications of this common, let's say this common uh, uh, pattern, historical pattern, and what it means and the implications that this has as far as the, you know, the dependence is um, the, as, as an issue. So, so this, is, this is just an observation. I'm not making an analogy of the Cuban revolution, but just the, if you look at the pattern of, of, of Cuban history from the 60s on, it's, they don't have you know, all, all these, these issues that I've just mentioned, it's totally different. So for instance, again, as commodity export countries, Latin America was all, so I'm gonna give some examples of this simultaneity. All Latin American countries were hit hard by the interwar economic depression and the economic crisis had political consequences in every country. In every country. So that if you look uh, at the, the political history of Latin America in the early thirties, you will find sudden political changes in the guise of military coups, civil wars and etc. in every country in the aftermath of the Wall Street crash in 1929. On the other hand, as you may know, the interwar depression was unwittingly, has unwittingly fostered the industrialization in many Latin American countries. The so-called import substitution industrialization, which was, which after the Second World War was theorized, was, was theorized by the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America, initially led by Argentinian economist Raul Prebisch, and later on by Celso Furtado, Brazilian Celso Furtado. Uh, by the way, I'm going to make a short parenthesis here. It is generally acknowledged that Latin America has given three major intellectual contributions uh, to the world, so to speak. On its, one is it's, uh, it's in the economic discussion of underdevelopment as it was developed by Eclas structuralists, by Prebisch, Furtado, and, and Aníbal Pinto in Chile and so forth. A second one would be the theology of liberation, that is to say, 
a brand of Catholicism that became deeply involved in social struggles, particularly under the, the Cold War. And um, so here you see in the picture, uh, one example was the, 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 the Colombian priest, sociologist and uh, guerrilla man, uh, Camilo Torres. But you can also see uh, Ernesto Cardenal, who was a former, he was a, um, a monk, but also a minister of the Sandinista um, government in Nicaragua after the triumph of the Sandinist revolution in 1979. So in this picture, you see these are the first moments of when uh, the Pope uh, John II arrived in, in, in Managua and he taunted uh, Cardinal, he kneeled uh, in front of the Pope and the, and the Pope taunted him as he did with the three, the, this government, they had three Catholic ministers. Um, and by the way, later on, the Pope was uh, booed by a huge crowd in Managua because he was, you know, criticizing this, that was an extremely popular revolution at that moment. So the third one would be the pedagogy originally developed by Brazilian thinker Paulo Freire, known as the pedagogy of the oppressive, which, by the way, became a favorite uh, target of Bolsonaro's uh, hatred politics. But of course, this underplays uh, our musical and food, football treasures, which uh, most Latin Americans cherish the most. But anyway, coming back to my talk, I was talking about a certain simultaneity between national processes uh, in the subcontinent. So that if we focus uh, South America since the Cold War, as opposed to Latin America, we'll see that most countries had national developmentalism as a landscape, that is to say, the development of a national industry understood as a premise to overcome underdevelopment, as the ECLA uh, put it at those days. So this implied different degrees of state interventionism and national market protection. However, this national development landscape was at odds with US corporate interests in the Cold War days, uh, as so as uh, U U.S. corporate enterprises also expanded as a, after Second World War. These tensions were one important dimension of the dynamics of revolution and counter-revolution that typified the region under the Cold War. A second dimension, dimension was, of course, the rise of social struggles, which had a powerful uh, push after the Cuban Revolution took place in 1959. So social tensions added up to economic contradictions in a context where political struggles were, became international. And the outcome of this situation was that military coups followed by dictatorships took place everywhere, particularly in the southern cone of South America. So in 1964, there, was, there were coups in Brazil and Bolivia, in 66 in Argentina, in 1973, there were coups and military dictatorships in Chile and Uruguay, and, in, and again in Argentina in 1976, while Paraguay was already under dictatorship since 1954. These dictatorships, in turn, they were dismantled in the 80s at, as, as, as the Cold War approached to its end. So at that moment, South American countries were faced with huge crisis, uh, debt crisis, they also faced economic stagnation and inflation, high inflation and sometimes hyperinflations. As in all cases, in all South American cases, the transition from dictatorship to, let's say, democracy was commanded from the top. So no dictatorship was toppled by a social movement from below. In the years that followed dictatorship, the, the, what I would call as the consented opposition to the dismantled regimes, they prevailed. This was because the radical opposition had been defeated or annihilated by state terrorism. So we are talking about the, the, the end, the last years of the Cold War. So this political conservatism implied that all countries were gradually subordinated to the International Monetary Fund, the IMF agenda. So as globalization accelerated, neoliberal adjustment programs put the last nails in the coffin of national developmentalism all over the region. It is interesting to note that there is a relation between the intensity of the repression that took place under dictatorships and resistance to neoliberalism in the coming decades. So, for example, if we think of Argentina, where there was, where there was uh, around um, 30,000 people missing 
neoliberalism was implemented in a radical fashion. Why do I say radical? Because every public enterprise was privatized and they were very close to dollarizing their economy. So this situation, for example, would contrast with, uh, with, the, with, with the situation of Brazil. So that in Brazil, in the late 70s, or precisely in 1980, um, there was, it was possible to form, to contrive the Workers' Party led by Lula. Uh, and that was still under dictatorship. So that in Brazil, overall, the um, resistance to neoliberalism was much more successful because resistance was also, they were in better condition to, 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 to build, um, to put up a fight after a dictatorship because much less people was killed in Brazil as compared with Argentina. An exceptional case in this frame was Chile under Pinochet, where high levels of repression, so high that the, the, the principal stadium, football stadium in, in Santiago was turned into prison in the first days of the regime. So that this, this high levels of repression set the context to a unique and pioneer experience of neoliberalism, led by Milton Friedman, young students known as the Chicago Boys. So in short, Pinochet became a hallmark of what Naomi Klein later described as shock capitalism. So on the whole, uh, the implementation of the neoliberal agenda between the 80s and the 90s eroded the old political forces, these old political forces that I've referred to as the, 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 the consented opposition to, to previous dictatorships. So their political prestige was, was eroded because of the unpopularity of the consequences of the neoliberal agenda. And this has opened space for new political forces. So at the same time, the corrosion of traditional instruments of class politics, such as trade unions and, and workers' parties, weakened the material base of political projects associated with the working class as such. So on the other hand, we see in the 80s and the 90s, the emergence of new political actors organized mainly as social movements, such as, such as was the case with the Brazilian landless movement, the piqueteros movement in Argentina, which were basically uh, jobless people who blocked the circulation of goods instead of the production of goods, they would block you know, roads and, and highways. And the Zapatistas in Mexico, who, who rose to the public in the same day that the the North American Free Trade Agreement that was signed with the United States and Canada was enforced in the 1st of January in 1994. However, the most striking political results were achieved by peasant movements linked to indigenous identities in Bolivia and Ecuador, where several presidents were overthrown at the beginning of the 21st century. So, it was the conjunction between the wearing out of conventional political of conventional politics and the rise of social protests that opened space for electoral novelty. So this is the background of what we've been calling the South American Pink Tide. So broadly speaking, the South American Pink Tide was the election of presidents that embodied social forces that rejected neoliberalism in almost every South American country in a short time span. So Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, he was elected in 1908. Then Lula in Brazil in 2002, the same year that Nestor Kirchner was elected in Argentina. Then Tabaré Vázquez in Uruguay, Morales in Bolivia, Correa in Ecuador, Lugo in Uruguay. In a way that the only countries that actually did not lean to the left were Colombia and Peru, countries where guerrilla movements were still active in the, in, in, in the 90s and in Colombia, some of the guerrillas are still active today. And this situation has led to a criminalization of the, the left as such, the whole left as such. So in these countries, there was no political alternation to the left. There was political novelty, but it took the, the, the shape of, of um, a, 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 a repressive regime in the case of Peru, Fujimori, and a repressive regime in the case of, of Colombia, which was the Uribe regime, which in many senses is, is the four, is, 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 let's say, a, a Bolsonaro, a Van Lalek, a, be, to, before his time. He was in the vanguard of, of, of what we're seeing now, Uribe in Colombia. So this is a peculiarity of the region. Neoliberalism worn out political, traditional political parties worldwide. But in South America, this has opened room for political novelty stemming from the left. 
either in the form of no of known political organizations such as the PT, which, as I said, was 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 uh, was formed in 1980, and Lula had already disputed four times the presidency before actually being elected. Or if we look to Uruguay and we see the Frente Amplo, which was contrived in the 70s, but also there were wholly newcomers, such as the case with uh, Morales in Bolivia, who came from a social movement, or Rafael Correa in Ecuador, who didn't even have a, a political party, or um, Fernando Lugo in, in Paraguay, who was a, a, a Catholic priest. So at a point, uh, some people, let's say from, from a right-wing perspective, we could say that the whole subcontinent was under left government, except Colombia. This is a bit of an exaggeration because it's very uh, debatable whether Peru and Chile were, but anyway, in Chile it was the socialist party. So uh, it could be said that it was leaning to the left, but, but it wasn't really uh, defined in liberalism in any meaningful sense. And so again, so why was that? It is key to understand that this was a context where neoliberalism was strongly contested on the streets. From the Caracas in Venezuela in the early 90s to five years of social unrest in Bolivia in the early 2000s, passing by the, Argent by the situation that Argentina had in December 2001, when five presidents were toppled in a week by popular protests, and the president, the first president, had to fly away in helicopter because he was basically besieged in his in his in his uh, in the House of Presidency. So, anyway, in short, in the late 90s, neoliberalism had lost its legitimacy everywhere. So it was against this background that progressive uh, presidents uh, were elected. However, it should be stated that these progressive presidents were perceived differently among those from above and among those from below. So to those from above, we could say from the standpoint of the ruling class, it was um, the election of progressive presidents was perceived as a crisis management alternative. So progressivism was perceived as a path to bring politics out of the streets and back to the institutions. This was clearly the case where social struggles were on fire as the cases in Argentina, Ecuador and Bolivia, as I've mentioned. On the other hand, when seen from, by those from below, progressive politics embodied hopes of change. They embodied uh, an alternative social project. Another world was possible, as it was said in the, in the World Social Forum that took place in, in Brazilian city of Porto Alegre in the early 2000s. So when we look at these different shades of progressive politics, what is their common denominator? What was their common ground? And moreover, what was their political bet? So we could say that their political bet was to pur the pursuit of social change without confronting the historical roots of, 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 of the social problems. That was the rule even when they reached the government among popular uprisings, as was the case in Ecuador and Bolivia, as already mentioned. So their landscape, the landscape of these of this progressive governments was conciliation aiming to improve this co the conditions of those from below while avoiding confrontation with, the, with those from above. This, abo this approach was embodied by the Zero Hunger Program launched by the first Lula administration in Brazil in 2003, whose leadership was, by the way, was, was handed to a Catholic friar. So it can be said that this was a, a sensitive approach. After all, we can, we can say, is it, is it necessary to overcome capitalism to end hunger? Possibly not. So in, a, in, in countries that had such acute social disparities, social inequality, such as Brazil and the whole of Latin America, this is at first a, a pretty sensible approach. So the bet was that it could, that a lot could be done to undermine inequality without facing structural constraints. Broadly speaking, this win-win situation was made possible against the background of the commodity super cycle, which was spurred by the, the, the expansion of the Chinese economy in the early 2000s. So uh, cash transfer policies, such as Bolsa Familia in Brazil, Cash transfer policies were, took place everywhere in Latin America, and they went hand in hand with a slight improvement in the minimum wage in most countries and the popularization of credit in every case. 
so so this brought um, a sensation of of, of material uh, progress that was mediated by by consumption in all in, in most countries that were under progressive governments at this point. So how did this bet evolve? At first, we could say that they were rather successful to the extent that all South American progressive governments were re-elected and or made their successors, with the exception of Fernando Lugo in Paraguay. However, uh, when we look, so this is this is questionable because this this um, includes uh, countries such as Peru and Chile, which as I this is debatable. But anyway, this gives you um, a, a frame of, of, of a general frame of of, of the, the a time frame of these governments. However, ten years later, that means. Today, as we so sorry, so 10 years ago, when Lula left the presidency in Brazil, Lula considered him to be the most popular politician on earth, while the economists portrayed the Rio de Janeiro Christ the Redeemer statue raising like a rocket with the caption, Brazil takes off. However, 10 years later, that is today as we speak, the tide seems to be reversed. Progressive expectations gave place to a reactionary overtone, which is embodied in the presidency of Bolsonaro. What happened? So I I'd say that this is the key question that my book addresses, this later book that Bella has referred to. So in short, how do I answer it? I'd say that, the, that first, I will, we have to look at some conjunctural factors. So there's been a conjunction of social, political, and economic factors that changed the framework within which progressive politics uh, made a life of. So there is a common grammar, a common social, political, and economical grammar. Uh, how could we synthesize this grammar? So in the economy, there was a worsening of the crisis, which expressed as recession and or inflation in most countries in the context of a slowdown in the commodity super cycle. In the social sphere, the legitimacy of progressivism was put in check, and it was put in check both from above and from below. So the promises that progressivism once embodied were no longer uh, credible. In the political realm, there was a growing malaise on the right, and this growing malaise was due to the perpetuation of progressivism in power. So as we see, most of them were, were still in power in the early 2010. And, and the language of this malaise was fundamentally the uh, denunciation of corruption. So therefore, it was not what I want to say that it was not a programmatic reaction. It was not a reaction compelled by a fundamentally economic uh, different agenda. This reaction, of course, has been favored by the international context, an indication of which was the unacceptable recognition of Venezuelan coup plotter Juan Guaido by the United States early in 2019. So this common uh, political, economic, and social grammar, of course, it has a, a particular expression in each national case. And we can discuss this different, uh, these particular expressions later. However, if we go beyond the conjuncture, we should look at structural trends. How does the, the uh, progressivism themselves explain their demise? In broad, uh, in, 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 in broad lines, the progressivist narrative reads the current situation as a backlash against social advancements of previous governments, a backlash that has been supported by the United States through what they call mostly as, as hybrid wars. They're taking uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an example, for example, what happened in U Ukraine. However, what my research shows is that we need to understand the unfolding and the demise of the pink tide through its own dynamic and its contradictions. So my argument can be outlined through uh, three oxymorons. First, a containment that accelerates. Second, a regressive progressivism. And third, an inclusive neoliberalism. I don't have the time to go in details on that, but I'll quickly outline the argument. What is the key point? The key point here 
is to observe that beyond the intentions of their leaders, so despite the good intention that Lula may have or Morales may have, the intention, the attempt to accommodate social tensions in Latin America, 20, in 21st century Latin America, this attempt to contain tensions imply a crisis management approach, which in the Brazilian case was called as, as a, 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 a pity way of government. But this crisis management approach in the long run aggravates the crisis that it intends to contain. And why is that? Because the attempt to contain a historical process of social disembedment, to use a, a Karl Polanyi framework, uh, so to the attempt to contain a historical process of social disembedment or of social corrosion, which is inherent to neoliberalism, this attempt implies practices, devices, and policies that end up accelerating this same process. This doesn't have to do with the intentions. This is despite the will of, the, of, 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 the, of their leaders. I'll give you two superficial examples referred to the Brazilian case just to give you a sense of the argument. So you might be aware that in 2016, uh, Lula's successor, a woman named Dilma Rousseff, who by the way has uh, Bulgarian roots, um, she was deposed by a controversial impeachment process, which was sought by many as a, as a coup. I include, and I, I'm included among those. So, the impeachment was led by her vice president, Michel Temer, that you see here in the picture. And Michel Temer then became the president of Brazil. But we can ask, how did this ordinary politician became Rousseff's vice president in the first place? Temer was brought to the vice president to seal a coalition with, with his conservative party, which is the largest conservative party in Brazil. And this conservative party later on conspired against the PT itself. So what I'm trying to illustrate is the attempt to prevent a political crisis, bringing this party to the government, giving them the vice presidency. So this is an attempt to contain the crisis was in the long run key to produce the political crisis in itself. That is to say, key to produce the acceleration of the crisis that produced the impeachment in 2016. A second example, you might be aware that Lula sent a Brazilian military to lead a controversial United Nations peace mission to Haiti, just following a US uh, invasion, military invasion in Haiti earlier in that year, which was very sad because it was precisely in the month that Haiti, the independence of Haiti was, was, was in, this, in, in its 200, year anniversary. So Brazil's participation was conceived under Lula, was conceived within the framework of the idea of making Brazil a global player. However, once back in home, the military was sent by the PT itself to implement their know-how, the know-how that they acquired in this, in this uh, so-called pacification missions in, in Haiti. So they were invited to implement this know-how in social pacification missions back home, particularly in Rio de Janeiro favelas in the context of the World Cup in 2014 and in the Olympic Games in 2016. So which was another leg of this global player uh, uh, design. Now, as you should know, the military filled the top posts of the Bolsonaro government which has more military men in charge than the Cold War dictatorship ever had. So the attempt to engage, in short, the attempt to engage the military men, in, um, to engage politically the military men under the PT in the long run has contributed to bring them back to power. So this containment or this attempt to contain that in the long run accelerates can be observed in all dimensions of social life. In the economy, I'll just give a, a sense of it. So in the economy, um, socioeconomic traits that go back to the colonial origin have been reinforced, namely the export of commodities. So that even in the golden ages of the commodity super cycle, Brazilian economy was further, has further deindustrialized. This is a trend that precedes the PT government that has been deepened 
during the pink tide, the deindustrialization of Brazil, which was the most industrialized economy in Latin America. At the same time, Venezuela's dependence on oil was, just, or was only aggravated under uh, the Bolivarian um, government, under Chavez and now Maduro. So this has resulted in a paradox. This is, a, we see a progressivism that was regressive from the standpoint of its economic base. So this is the regressive progressivism that I referred to earlier on. However, it should be clear that this re regression um, should not be, this regression should not be mistaken as a return to the past, as consumption mediated integration mediated by cash transfer policies and cheap consumption. We're going to see uh, that, um, let's say, um, uh, anti-democratic uh, trends in, in each of these. Of these. So what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to suggest is that this trend, this social disembedment, this Uh, social inequality, of, of mitigating social inequality, and also uh, political dependence uh, that typified, you know, the, the pink tie. So the bottom line is, and here I come to, to an end, the end of my talk, the bottom line is, uh, again, the social corrosion trend inherent to neoliberalism is universal, and progressivism corroborates it despite its intentions. So how are we supposed to overcome it? This is uh, an open question. Of course, this is not an easy question. And this is very much for your attention. I'm sorry, I was having network issues and I, I was just dropped out of, of the Zoom call. But back here, do you hear me, Fabio? Fabio, can you hear me? Yes, but now you seem to be. Yes, I can. Your, your, your video seems to be frozen, but I can hear you fine. Okay, yeah, I had network issues. I'm still having network issues. So I lost the final five minutes of your talk, but I guess that you are done by now, or you just stopped. Now you hear me? Now do you hear me? You lost the grand finale where I just <laughs> answered all the questions and I gave the solution to where we are, but that's fine. <laughs> you can see videotape it later. <laughs> okay, good. So I guess that uh, this is the time to, to go to the questions. And I, I really hope that the audience has quite a lot of questions. I myself have questions about the frameworks or the narratives of explanation that you have, uh, that you have mentioned in your presentation of which one is uh, the external, so the fall of the commodity prices. Another one is internal, this growing right-wing discontent, uh, coupled with this anti-corruption uh, sentiment, which is some sort of explanation or a narrative for explaining uh, this ebb of the pink tide. So the, like, like uh, most of, you cannot hear me. I can hear, but not clearly. I understood the beginning of the question. Okay, I try to be simple. I suggest typing it out in chat. Yeah, I will type it, perhaps it's better. Well, now I listen to you, it, it seems to be fine now. Okay, let's, let's, let's give it a second try. So, now you hear me? Okay, I'll type it.
can you see my question in the chat? Okay, so I may have some questions if we can have them. Okay, uh, so you have mentioned that the US, for example, uh, supported um, the Southern American countries in this sort of, um, well, going back to the right, basically. So compared to the pink tide, there's this, I don't know what to call blue tide. And you said the US supported it. Did you mean just the Trump administration or even before that? Thank you, Sultan. Um, so uh, actually I was saying that uh, in, in my, in the research that I've done, it is two, two things are clear. Like the US never, they have never stopped to This has not been the key drive to regime change that has taken place in Latin America recently. So it has nothing to do with the context. For example, if we look uh, to the toppling of, of Salvador Allende in 73 in Chile, and then you have all these documents where there was, they were openly supporting uh, the military you know, to overthrow Chile and they were giving money to trade unions and they were they were openly uh, conspiring against the regime. This, this was not the case. Um, so it was not the key drive. And the same can be said about Venezuela. Of course, that the, the boycott, the embargo that, they're, 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 um, that Venezuela is facing aggravates the crisis, but it's not the cause of the crisis. So, um, so this is a first point. I don't. So this is very clear. The U.S. is not um, a, a key drive, and this is very different from uh, when we look at um, Cold War uh, regime changes that took place. Uh, so, for example, I'm not very familiar with what happened in Ukraine. Perhaps you were more than I, but here in Brazil, there is, um, or in Latin America in general, just to give you a sense of what I'm speaking. There is this Russian uh, author, which apparently is not very known in Russia, but he's, he's, he's written uh, the, uh, his work in the concept of, of uh, hybrid war. So a hybrid war would be basically the kind of interference in countries that goes, you know, like kind of soft power interference that mobilizes, you know, um, social media networks. And, and so, they would say that, for example, in Egypt, they kind of manipulated, you know, the uprising and and, and so forth. It was like a Western-driven um, uh, popular mobilization, and they would apply this framework for Ukraine, and then they will apply this framework to Latin America. Uh, so, to give you um, one one um, good reference in English, which is a very serious place that this very interesting work, but I, I don't agree with this framework, is the Tricontinental tri Institute, I'm going to type here, which is headed by um, Vishay Prashad, he's from Indian background. Just to give you um, one, one example where you're going to find this kind of narrative. Um, sometimes, well, well, so so this is so this is the um, uh, the answer, and and this comes at odds. For example, when we look at the 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 election in Ecuador, and so I will come to answer to uh, Bella uh, Bella's question soon after. Uh, in Ecuador, well, Ecuador is a small country. Uh, what is the relevance? Why am I going to speak about the, the Ecuadorian election that took place just very recently? Because it 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 it, it brings to light the contradictions that I want to highlight here. In Ecuador, in the first round of the election, there were three strong candidates. One was, let's say, the man of, of progressivism, the man from Rafael Correa, who ruled the country between 2007 and 2017. So the second one was the traditional oligarchy, a banker, so let's say the traditional right. But then there was a third candidacy, 
And that was somebody that came from indigenous movements. Indigenous movements had been very much repressed by progressive governments, not only in Ecuador, but also in Bolivia or just everywhere. They are not being repressed in Mexico, for example, because um, the bet, the economic bet of these this progressive governments is to uh, is economic growth, which is fostered by the export of commodities. But the exploitation of commodities imply social and environmental conflicts, which bring which cause conflicts with you know with peasant and indigenous movements. So in Ecuador, this was a big reality under Correa's government. So they had a third option. It was not a, how did part of the, the left, of the international left, portray this third option? He was portrayed as a sort of a Trojan horse of the right. There were articles that circulated, for example, in the Jacobin or in other left-wing uh, outlets with this, with this vision. I can, I can I, I, I can tell you very frankly, like um, uh, I, I know a lot of people that voted for the indigenous candidacy, which are not right winger. They're just, they're just, they're, they're different left, let's say. A left that is not for progress, if progress is to be understood as the exploitation of natural resources and the, to, 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 to have this, you know, this, this commodity led exploitation, uh, exportation um, uh, economy. Uh, so this was, uh, so this kind of, of, of illustrates what I'm, what I'm trying to say, but in the, in the, in the, in the end, um, uh, the, the first one was very close and the, the people that are with indigenous candidacy, they believe that there was fraud to take the banker to the second round. I'm not in a position to say if there was fraud or not. I'm just saying that this is what they argue. So actually when the second round took place, they called for abstention. They didn't vote for, for this uh, progressive um, candidate. And some actually voted for the right-wing traditional candidate. And why was there fraud? Because uh, progressivist candidates thought that this, um, this right-wing candidate would be much easier to beat in the second round. Because if we look from the outside, if, you, if we were to add up all votes that the left, so-called left had, they add up to almost two thirds of the votes. So, but in the but after, but when elections took place recently, we had a comeback of this. So actually, it was the first time this man, this banker, had won for presidency several times. Now he was finally elected. Sorry if I may. So uh, you're saying left and right. Sure. Uh, but in um, in South America, in uh, perspective, what do you mean by right and left? Because we you know in Europe and in the U.S whole right and left thing means different things. So in, in this case, what do you mean by right and left? Yes, this is this is an excellent question, Zoltan. Um, um, because so broadly speaking, I'm, I'm calling here as left, these uh, political parties and political figures that embodied this uh, pink tide that were identified with these governments. But this is pretty much, let's say, a state-oriented left. So they are, these are political parties that believe that once they are, you know, in they, they, they won't win the elections, they're gonna, well, just, just, just what I've just described in my talk. This, was, this is their bet. However, from the standpoint of these left, so I'm gonna quote now Rafael Correa, the former president of Ecuador. He said that the greatest enemies of his government were environmentalist people, what he called the, inf uh, the childish left, you know, like from Lenin and indigenous movements. So uh, why? Because from his perspective, you had to exploit natural resources, you know, to bring economic growth to the country and through economic growth he will have more resources you know to make all these cash transfer policy programs and so forth however 
this kind of uh, politics, I'm going to make a very poor comparison, but just to give you um, um, a, 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 an example, forgive me for the, think of the collectivization, Stalinist collectivization of, of, of agriculture in the 1920s. So you, you are, you're, you're for the development of productive forces, so to speak, but on the process of doing that, you just, you just repress peasants all over. So it's a bloody process. So uh, this is not, obviously this is not what has taken place in Ecuador, but the, but the rationale is comparable in the sense that in the name of progress, they have caused lots of conflicts with grassroots movements, grassroots movements who had peasant or indigenous roots. And these movements, in which sense we could say that they are left? We could say that they are left because they don't identify themselves with neoliberalism. However, we could also say that they are left because of a second issue, because they are against what they call in, in, in Spanish extractivism. Extractivism should be understood as this, this drive of exploiting natural resources and organizing the whole of the economy around that which is also read by some people as a sort of updating of the colonial logic from the past. This is one of the reasons that I wanted to, to make this, you know, this short um, introduction, historical introduction, to see how does that resonate, for example, in indigenous people in Bolivia and Peru who have, you know, they have the, 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 the framework of, of colonial exploitation since uh, for centuries. And, and so, all these other aspects come to, to, to play. Um, so this is how I would say that they're they are left. Now, to address Bella's question of the left coming back, this has to be seen context by context. But I would say, Bella, that we, to give you a, 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 a broad answer, how would I, um, if I would have to make one slide, how do I defer Bolsonaro from the PT, for example? It's not because of the economy. So we could say that, that the rationale of the PT government in Brazil is a kind of a crisis containment. They're not addressing the structural causes of social problems that we face, but they do have the attempt of containing that. What does Bolsonaro propose? Bolsonaro proposed to accelerate the crisis. However, once he starts accelerating, accelerating, and this is what he's been doing, what his agenda has been doing to the country. And, I, and by accelerating, I'm saying like taking off uh, social rights, working rights, environmental uh, protection and so forth. So, so we are gonna uh, speed up the conditions for this, uh, for this um, uh, accumulation by, by dispossession, if, we, if, if you want. Um, However, when this starts gaining momentum, part of the ruling class in Brazil now realizes, for example, that he's going too fast. And this might have, uh, this is having, you know, devastating consequences, not only because of the COVID crisis, but of course the COVID crisis, we're, it's, 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 a, it's a catastrophe what's happening in Brazil now. So this is the context, for example, when Lula comes back to the game. I don't know if you follow that in, in Hungary, but Lula didn't run up to the election in, in 2018 because of, of a court, a judicial process. So he was unable to, 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 to run, to dispute with Bolsonaro. Now he's back. The question that I ask you, was there any new judicial uh, evidence? Absolutely none. So these judges that impede, that, that didn't allow Lula, the same ones that didn't allow Lula to run in 2018, are now bringing him back to the game. Why is that? There is a political logic. It's not, it's not a, 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 a juridical logic. So it's, it's, it's justice made, it's politics made through justice. So I would say, so when you look at Bolivia, so what happened? So Morales was, Morales, it's, it's, it's a complex context, the one that, that Morales was deposed, because it, it should be, we should bear in mind that the Morales government was impopular in many, in, 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 in some senses, or to be more precise, 
the popular, the grassroots base of the Morales government has been shattered at least since 2011. And this has to do with this uh, extractivist drive of his government. Okay, then he was, he, he has been president for three mandates and he wanted to run for a fourth mandate. He runs a plebiscite, a referendum. He loses the referendum, but still insists. He again, he goes to justice, like the case in Brazil, and justice says, yes, this is a human right because we subscribe to the International Convention of the, of the Organization of, 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 of the States of the America. So this is above our constitution, so he can run in short. So this was, this was a very critical decision. It was very unpopular to many, which are not Bolsonaro people in Bolivia. This is what I want to say. It was put to, under liberal eyes. This was very problematic. And then there is the, the, the election is going on. And what is the, 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 how does the election in Bolivia work? It says that if the candidate has a 10% surplus of votes in the first round, there is no second round. So Morales, so they're, they're, they're counting on votes. Over 90% are counted. And he has like 90 comma something percent. Then there is a breakdown in the process. When there is this breakdown for a few days, when the, when, when the system is back again, he wins with 10% barely. So this has triggered rebellion. And this rebellion, so I'm not saying that there was a fraud or there was not a fraud. I don't have the, the, the evidence to say that it, whether there was or there, or there was not. What I'm, what I'm suggesting is that from the standpoint of those that, that there, there was this malaise, this unease with the insistence of Morales in staying in power. And this is what actually came to the streets within that election. Then Morales wanted to repress, then he calls the police, the police says, the police says this will not repress. So he calls the military and the military says, no, we're not gonna go against them because the military killed a lot of people in Bolivia in 2003. And this was very costly for them for many reasons. Well, anyway, so then they said, they, then they said, Morales, you should go. Then you can say there was, let's say a, a coup procedure, a coup oriented pr procedure, but, they, but and then what comes next? Then Morales says that everybody in his party has to resign, which is difficult to understand because even if Morales was out, they dominated the politics, they dominate the parliament. So the vice president was his, it was not like, like in Brazil, vice president was from his party. The, 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 the parliament was from his party, but they said everybody resigns. So it generates this political situation where then the right starts to, to, to take profit off. Then they want to, to jump in the, in, the, in, the, in the driver's seat, so to say. And then just to, to end up, but the thing is that then this Janine Yanez, she, she starts, she has this very unpopular government, very repressive, very corrupt, and, and so that the point that I want to say is that when mass comes back, it comes back much more as a least worst vote then so it's not a comparable situation as as, as as in 2006 when there was lots of hope very few people is is expecting a bright future for bolivia under this government now and in argentina just to give you a quick uh, just one word <laughs> kirchner came back in but in the vice presidency so it's debatable to say whether uh it was uh progressivism came back or not many argentinians don't see that way, because Fernandez, when he was, he worked with Kirchner and they, all these agreements they had when Kirchner, when Cristina Kirchner was the president, was he took, let's say, uh, more conservative positions as opposed to, to Cristina. So it's debatable whether that was a comeback of progressivism or not. Sorry, Rod, you've been willing. Okay, no, I, I want to, to make a point and then ask a question, but actually first I have to uh, thank Fabio Luis for the talk and Bella for uh, articulating this extraordinary uh, international uh, convocation which brings um, Brazil to Ireland amongst other places uh, via Budapest, so thank you all. I mean, of the many things you've been talking about, what I appreciate most 
is a wide shot, as you would say in film, a broad brush stroke, which looks for a structural analysis, which doesn't talk about what uh, Bolsonaro said yesterday. It really looks underneath the pattern of the surface. And I think that is really a, a refreshing perspective to, to, to take. And it's clear that whatever the intentions, which actually don't necessarily matter, all the difference of intentions that led to the pink tide, and then the different forms of uh, reaction or rejection to that pink tide, ideological, physical, conspiratorial, non-conspiratorial, all together in complex ways, uh, we reach a new situation now. And I suppose if we want to be optimistic, we have to believe that the same determinations and motivations that led to the shift of the pink tide uh, exist and continue, and therefore, uh, to use your um, beach metaphor, the, the tide comes up the beach, it goes down, and it will come up again. Okay, we're taking the natural world there. But the question uh, I was put to you, Fabi Luis, is uh, there's one structural uh, underlying element that you didn't really talk about, which is quite unique and specific in the Latin American post-war history, which is the relationship of a whole combination of quite different countries. That the countries are quite different. They have connections, but their cultures and their politics are a little bit different. And yet, as you have shown in the pink tide and then the, the reflux, the return of the pink tide, actually the whole thing has really uh, connected in some way, which is really quite unusual. I don't see it happening in Europe, in Africa, in Latin, in, in, in Asia, really. So that, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. Thank you. Thank you, Rod, for, for your comments and for your question, which is an excellent question. And it's one that I, that I ask myself a lot. Two questions that I ask myself a lot. One is why the pink tide in Latin America, since let's say neoliberalism was a global phenomenon. Uh, if we look, let's say to Africa or to, I'm not talking about Eastern Europe because it was a completely different context then, but uh, why was that this, this kind of reaction in, in, in South, uh, one, one key point is, is easy to, to see, which I, I've highlighted in my talk, which was the, the social struggles, but but social struggles perhaps were everywhere. So why did it, 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 so this is one question that I kind of ask to myself and I just don't have, you know, the, the knowledge, the sufficient knowledge of, of other contexts to, to advance any hypothesis here. But I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, um, it's worth uh, investigating. Then you say, um, you talk about the, the simultaneity. Um, and, um, and I think this is, this is very important because this also was a potential of the pink tide in the sense that beyond what this specific national uh, uh, regimes could do by themselves isolated, there was also a potential of synergy between them of doing things together. And this was exploited in different ways uh, by Venezuela and by Brazil. I'm going to exploit the two main, I'm going to comment on the two main expressions. What was the Venezuela's bet? Uh, they call the, the alliance, the Bolivarian Alliance of the Americas, which is ALBA in Spanish. This was basically like a, a regional integration process, which was uh, at first they, 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 they partnered with Cuba. And so they wanted it to be uh, let's say more than just an economic integration, they wanted it to be a political integration, looking at, uh, let's, let's say, an alternative, um, an anti-systemic uh, landscape, so to speak. Uh, because just a, a quick di digression, Venezuela was the first in 98. Then Chavez in 2001, he was faced with a coup attempt. This coup was reversed, and then there was this Irish. It's a brilliant documentary. I don't know if you if you if you know that Re revolution will not be televised. Yes, revolution I wrote a book about it. It's called "The Revolution Not Be Televised." 
Oh, you wrote it. So you know much better. But I, I find that, that that's, that's an extraordinary uh, documentary. Uh, so anyway, so the, the coup was reversed. So then there was this attempt of, of you know, of the, lock, of, of the lockout and, you know, of bringing the economy down. And well, anyway, early 2003, Chavez has defeated his opposition. Then he looks around and he sees that Lula is starting his presidency in Brazil and Kirchner is about to take power in Argentina. So he looks around and says, well, this is, I'm not alone anymore. So let's, let's go left, yes? So it's not only because of the, the internal dynamics that, 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 so I think the specificity of Chavez within the, the pink type context is, is that he was the only one that when faced with conflict, he actually took a road to the left, let's say. He responded to conflict, not in the way of conciliation, but anyway. So then he looks around, he sees this, and then he comes with this idea of the Alba, yeah? Because then there's this possibility of, of, of regional integration. But then Lula has a different game. What is his game? His game is regional integration under the leadership of Brazil. So what actually he proposes with Argentina is the Union of Nations of South America, which in, in Spanish is, is, is called UNASUR. I'll type here. So which is the first political institution that actually a uh, regional institution where the United States doesn't take part. This is an important uh, accomplishment, so to speak. And, but it also, uh, uh, every South American country participates. And what was the condition to bring together such different countries like Uribe's Colombia, which was like Bolsonaro's, uh, Colombia's Bolsonaro's and Chavez in the same organization. It was to, to give veto power because uh, every decision had to be taken unanimously. So this is basically giving veto power to each country. So, because, and why was that logic? So Brazil was logic, the logic of conciliation and the least common denominator that they, that they played inside domestically, they were projecting that to the regional arena. So this, so then UNASUR came, because what was their idea? The idea was that Brazil leading with the political leadership of UNASUR and an economic leadership of, because then there was all, all this politic of the internationalization of Brazilian enterprise, particularly in South America and Africa. And so they called them the, the national champions politics, policies. So, so the idea, so this was part of this design of making Brazil a global player. So that's why then Lula sends Brazilian uh, military to Haiti. Then the PT goes and gets the, you know, the Olympic games. The, all this is part of the idea of making Brazil a global player. So from this standpoint, the, 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 the ALBA initiative from Venezuela was seen as a competition, as something that was, that was a concurrence and not as something that should be so Brazil never stepped into this, um, this, the, the initiatives that Venezuela proposed. Since Brazil is much more powerful politically and economically, it's half the economy, half the territory of South America. So Venezuela came into UNASU because of course, it's better to have a, an ally than to be alone, even if you have to bow to the, the, the political or to, to the design of this, of this uh, um, uh, stronger ally. Um, but then what happens? So once the tide is over, UNASUR is gone. This has been dismantled recently. This is literally dismantled. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. They, 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 they shut down their office. So, um, so this is, this is a, this a little bit like it has to do. So as Bella was saying in, in, in the book I wrote, there is one chapter that deals with the regional integration issue that basically goes deeper into these uh, issues that I've just um, uh, outlined here um, talking to you. But, I, but a second dimension that I, that I might add is that it's very interesting to, to observe that in Latin America, there are um, the communications, let, let, let's say invisible political uh, connections. Polit um, what, I, what I want to say is, for example, when there was the Cuban revolution in 59, then in the early 60s, there were guerrilla, guerrillas everywhere in Latin America. 
Um, in a not obviously not because the Cuban were creating guerrilla all over because they never did that. They did support at some point, but they never created. Some of these guerrillas they were they were they they, they, they preceded the Cuban Revolution. Some not, but the thing is what I what I what I'm trying to suggest is that what happens in one country has a lot of influence in what happens to the other. I'm gonna give you another very quick example. Um, in Chile, the first, um, the, the, the demonstrations against this, uh, what I call the real new liberalism, which is uh, Chilean society, they started with um, students in 2006, then students again, but then university students in 2011. But when, when there was this, uh, the students, they, they called the, the rebellion of the penguins because of the uniform they wear. So they would occupy schools. One year later, we had schools occupied in all south of Brazil. This cannot be a coincidence. And when you do field research, you see that people, that there was connection, communication, and beyond the, 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 the ideas that circulate was, uh, uh, you know, strategies. It was, it was the belief that it was possible to accomplish something through that resistance because the Chileans had. So, uh, so I usually, I, sometimes I, I, I tend to speculate. Like, so this is, so this is in one, one important thing to understand why repression or let's say counter-revolution in Brazil always takes, I would say a, a preventive uh, nature. So that the, the military coup in 64 was, it was really nothing to, to worry about. It was nothing compared to what Chile was in the, in the early seventies. It was a socialist president that was building socialism and so forth. It was, it was, it was not the case in Brazil, but, but why is that always so preventive? Be, because when I stop to think, Brazil is half of, of the economy, half of the territory of South America. So let's say a Brazil going left or a Brazilian revolution would be closer to, to what the Russian revolution was than to what the Cuban revolution was. The, 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 I mean, the global impact. So it, it was, he was the second. So it was a push to candidates all over. And I'm not talking a push because the PT sent people and sent money. No, this is, eventually they did send people to help on their campaigns and give their know-how and say, we're gonna make an, a, this is how we won the election. So you should, you should, for example, one key thing they would say, you should not identify yourself with, with Chavez. You should identify yourself with Lula because this is much better seen by the elite. So, and so forth. So they, 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 they did give assistance, but this was, you know, this is a minor thing. Um, uh, the thing is that people were seen and they, they believed. And so there was, there was a tide we could, we could so to speak. Thank you so much, Fabio, for the detailed answers. And time is up, so we have to close the session. But before doing that, I would like to ask the audience if anybody still has some, some quick questions that are really into the topic and they would not really want to leave uh, the conversation without having any sort of answer to that. So still a couple of minutes for quick questions, if you have any. Okay, if not, then, well, I would like to wrap up the discussion that we had. And I'm really, really happy that Fabio accepted our invitation to, to uh, take part um, in, in this uh, virtual event. I see a question in the chat whether uh, the recording will be published. Uh, the idea is yes, I have to check the recording because I was thrown out from the conversation several times. So I really hope that uh, uh, still uh, the recording will be uh, will be there on my computer. But we have a YouTube channel. So the at uh, Latin America Research Center uh, has a Facebook page on which uh, you found the event and also a YouTube channel in which the recording or at least parts of, uh, of, of uh, the recording will be published. So thank you very much. I think that uh, it was, I, I, I can join Rod to, to saying that yes, this was something really broad, really uh, comprehensive and overarching. Uh, 
an approach which we usually don't have if we approach Latin American politics. We want to understand, for example, uh, why the, the Ecuadorian re, uh, elections had such results, but we don't really go back that much in time. So this is why I really appreciate that sort of, of uh, broad um, uh, way of, of, uh, of presenting events uh, with their historical and economic historical background uh, dating back to, to previous centuries. So thank you very much, Fabio, once again. And thank you also for the audience for being with us. Um, and uh, yes, uh, the Alta Latin America Research Center is uh, going on uh, organizing online lectures. I really hope that at a given point in time, we, we can go back to, to, to real uh, lectures in a real classroom. But uh, uh, despite the difficulties of, of doing everything online, uh, today we had the opportunity to listen to Fabio who is in Brazil. Uh, so we had, um, we had the opportunity to talk across continents and across countries. Thank you so much for being with us and thank you very much Fabio for the excellent lecture. Thank you, Bella. And just to say that um, I picked this approach because I thought it would be uh, most appropriate since I don't know the background the audience had, but I'll be very happy uh, to go further in the discussion of specific uh, situations in the future if, uh, if another occasion arises. And uh, again, I'm very keen to develop this connection with uh, Hungarian uh, partners and such as you. Thank you. Thank you very much.